about your EV advantage in, in the game of poker. The other thing that I wanted to talk about a little bit briefly was when you were talking about the bluff catching spot when you when you would call if somebody bets half pot, you know, and you call that half pot, you only need to be right one quarter of the time. But oftentimes you're gonna call and lose because even if it's you lose 30% of the time, it's a, it's a good call that you made, but in the long term, that's not going to be a winning play, right? And you were kind of hopping on this point a little bit. But I wanted to bring about the flip side of talking about this, is that sometimes in order to understand a problem deeply, we need to consider both sides of the equation at a deep level. So that means that we need to understand that if we do feel this way, and this is the natural way for us to feel as humans, then the way we exploit it is that it's often gonna be very plus EV to bluff in these situations because our opponent is gonna be facing the same issue and the same problem. So for us to properly understand the problem, I think we should shine more light on, on why we can use these spots to bluff more. I think we have to start with risk aversion being probably the biggest driver in why the pools are just notoriously passive. There was a time where we had to speculate on that, but now with the type of data software that we have and the extent of the vision that we have, we know hands down that across the vast majority of the game tree, the pool, the market, all of the players in general, over hundreds of millions of hands are defaulting passively. Now that means there are many more spots than there should be where you have the ability to generate exploitative amounts of fold equity by betting too frequently with bluffs. Once, once you map this out, which is what we do in, in my, my coaching for profits arena, and it's basically the core of my training process is like, we really try to create a very distilled map of all the zones where people are defaulting passively, folding too much, basically. And the really interesting thing about it is like that part of our process is probably the simplest process. It's not very hard for me to teach someone, I want you to bluff in these spots and just use this sizing when you get here. And that's good enough. That's taking care of most of the win rate. Just make sure you bet when you get to this spot because they're going to fold too much. Much of that aggressive side of our strategy is, I guess you could say simple. Now that the interesting thing about it is that even after being trained that, and even after the student consciously knows that that's a spot he should bluff, if he is risk averse, he won't bluff in that spot because he's afraid of getting called. So this risk averse thing works both ways. We're basically training people your opponent is going to overfold because your opponent is risk averse. So you need to bluff in this spot, but only some players are able to bluff consistently because they're risk averse and they don't want their bluff to get called. So it's like this weird game of hot potato where you're constantly trying to like train a player to keep pulling a trigger in the right spot. And he's constantly showing you that something is overriding his ability to do that in his mind. And it's, it's risk aversion. So it's the biggest thing that it's like, I don't get frustrated by it anymore because I understand it. But when I was first experiencing how, how unable people were to just follow consistent aggressive metrics when we had scientific proof that they were going to be winning, that their opponents were folding too much, it got me thinking like, oh, this risk averse thing is deeper than I thought. It's not just for people who are facing bets. It's for people risking bluffs. It's affecting everyone. And I think it's very apparent in society too that like we're a very defensive society. There's no, there's no question to me why the market's default passive when we look at the world, basically. So I don't know if that will change. Like that's the, the thing I think about sometimes is like the market hasn't really shifted in six years. It's been passive for six years. And what what makes me curious more than anything is like what will it be like in three years are we going to have a completely reversed market where now bluffing is very silly because people just 
call everything. And now maybe we make all of our money by value betting. That's what keeps me interested. It's, it's what's going to require us to kind of like stay diligent with continuing to explore the data end of things. But my hunch is that we're not going to see a shift because fear is a very, very powerful thing. And it's what is creating the risk aversion. And I don't really see huge potential for people to overcome that type of fear without deep mindset work, which it doesn't seem like people are actually willing to do. There is, there is more layers to it than simply just risk aversion. There is also loss aversion where it's it, the money that you have is worth more than the money that, that you could tend to win, right? Yeah. And, and that kind of lay, that stacks on top of risk aversion. Plus, there is also earlier when we talked about uh, people gr- grasping for certainty. I think generally we are, are not great at dealing with uncertainty. I mean, as a, as a species. And this is like evolutionary probably. When uncertain things happen, you know, you could die, you could lose your life. So naturally, we, we want certainty and we don't want uncertainty. And with rich spot, there is a lot of uncertainty and people shy away from, from those spots. So I, I find it very hard to believe the market will shift to the other end of the spectrum where people become... Um, I mean, the only way for that to happen is if, if the AIs and the robots just play in a way that counters humans very well. Then they would implement a strategy that takes on a lot more risks and takes on a lot more of these spots. I mean, if that happens, humans are done because it's very easy to exploit the human with even so like, I almost see what we do. I don't like to frame it like this because it sounds like almost like cheating, but the amount of data vision that we have, if we train that to a player, it's almost like we're training a bot hybrid at that point. I'm basically telling you like, here's where the market's exploitable, provable through scientific vision, go execute this and play as many hands as you can. That's the closest thing that you could have to building a bot. Like the next thing past that is building a bot where the bot would have full, the same vision and just be able to, to implement faster. There's a thing called emotional deficit, I think it's called. And it goes back to the layers of risk aversion. It basically, I don't know exactly the proportion here, but like losing money is more painful than winning money. It's like proven that and when that happens maybe it's like a two to one thing that like losing money is twice as painful as winning it i'm not sure the exact number but i know that it's more painful than winning is pleasant and what starts to happen is if you have equal amounts of wins and losses well your emotional deficit has built up because of the disproportional uh effect on your mood i guess you could say so it's, it's like this X, it, it's not just the fact that you're not being rewarded even close to half the time for good decisions. It's also the fact that negative outcomes are disproportionately more painful than positive outcomes, which messes with your head a ton because it feels like you're never winning. <laughs> if you go on any sort of downswing where you're running below average, it can start to feel like you, like you just never win. Not only is it that there's an emotional deficit building up that makes it feel more painful, but then there's further distortion happening in the mind through storytelling and it just starts to pile on itself and spins out of control. And, and here's the most interesting thing. When you start to have a, like my, my CFP team is like 40 guys right now. And we ran some numbers on this and we gave our players like modest win rates when we ran these simulations. But long story short, at any given time, just based on the realistic variance of having 40 guys that we, that we stake, one player at any given time is going to be in the midst of like a 40 buy-in downswing or more, like a career crippling downswing. And we have to keep a good perspective over that because that guy is always in the group communicating. And if that guy is always present because of, because of variance alone, we need to be able to deliver a perspective to the group that says, Hey guys, like this is supposed to happen. It sucks that it's happening to you. If it, like, it's, it's really unlucky if you're the one that it's happening to, but this is not outside of the scope of the reality of the model that we're in. Cause if we start to play this game with ourselves, like, Oh my God, one of our players is on the biggest downswing ever. Like what's going on? Is the system solid or, you know, is he playing horribly? He could be playing 
totally fine. He could be a three, five BB winner even. And this is just something that happens. And it's, I think the hardest thing is to continue to run simulations and offer perspectives that, that kind of don't allow people to take these wild, to make wild inferences about things that are actually much more realistic than they seem. Because as soon as people start to tell stories about how this is the most unlucky thing that could have ever happened, like that's a very bad paradigm to be in. That's a very self-confirming uh, victim narrative that will result in you not taking the necessary actions to recover from that downswing. And normally people don't. It's why I think like, uh, this is why I'm no longer interested in staking guys on sites where they can't have very high win rates. Because if I put a guy onto poker stars, for instance, at 25 or 50 cent to start him off, that guy might have like a two to three BV win rate. If you run the simulations on the variance involved and having a three BB win rate, you go on a 50 buy-in downswing 25% of the time. That's very, very likely that you're going to go on a downswing that puts you out of the game because you can't expect a new guy to have the type of mindset to be able to handle a 40 to 50 buy-in swing. It's just not practical that he's never dealt with anything like that. He's expecting to come in and win, and then he gets hit with one of the worst downswings ever, but it's actually not that uncommon. So, so much of what I try to do when I, when I get a new player who, who seems eager to develop is at this point, I'm trying to put him in an environment where he has the best chance to stick the landing and, and get on an upswing. You got to be really conscious of how likely it is that you could go on a downswing. That's the first half of it. Like getting okay with the fact that downswings exist, but the, the scientific part of countering that model is let's put ourselves in the softest pools possible because the higher our win rate is, the lower our variance becomes. Yeah. I, I mean, I have a lot of experience with seeing soft games in Asia. There are always a lot of soft games and it, I think it's just the best strategy to be playing in those from a career development perspective, because if you don't find games where you have a big win rate, it's hard for you to really sustain your career. But one thing I wanted to, to uh, talk to you about, since you were mentioning about downswings, is that a question that I get a lot is, how, many, how do I manage my bankroll? How many buy-ins do I need? And I wanted to see how you do it for your CFP students. Sure. Yeah, that's a, that's a cool question to talk about. We've gone through some different models. Uh, we've done it all wrong. <laughs> there were times, you know, sort of what I'm talking about, where in 2017 or so, we had opportunities on certain sites where, and I think I've talked to you about this too. Like, I think I laughed at you when we were in Australia together. Uh, I asked you, you know, what's the most you've ever sat with at a table, at a live table? And you said something like 25% of my bankroll. And I was like, get out of here. That's so much to be risking at any given time. And you're like, yeah, but like there's a fish at the table and you just got to sort of roll with it. Um, so I get that. Uh, I, I do understand and applaud that type of risk taking, even though I think it is borderline reckless. Like I get it. Now, when we're running a company that has to be able to have sustainable liquidity, what we've learned is we just definitely need to be more careful about protecting the investment from the start. So these days what we do is usually we get a new, we get a new player, we put them on sort of like a $1,500 bankroll and all of our players have to start from pretty much like small stakes, micro stakes, unless they've already been proven winners, in which case we make exceptions. But if you don't have a proven track record, you will start with basically a $1,500 buy-in, a $1,500 bankroll, and that's like 30 or 40 buy-ins at smaller micro stakes. From that point on, we require you to make, you know, 30, 40, or 50 buy-ins, depending on what stake you're moving up to. We let you move up relatively aggressively. Uh, so if you make 30 buy-ins, you can move up to, you know, small stakes, and then you need to make 50 buy-ins before you can move up to mid stakes. And then you need to make 80 more buy-ins before you can move up to high stakes. All the while, you're only ever moving up with profits. So we never invest more than $1,500 in a player, basically. That's how we protect the investment, which is the big shift that we made uh, from how we used to do it previously, which is like we could have a guy go into over 10,000 in makeup, which is not just bad for the company, but it's also bad for the player. Because now the player's 
got a $10,000 red line makeup and it's affecting his mindset and it's very unlikely he's going to crawl out of that. So the biggest thing I think is to start with conservative bankroll management from the beginning with a clear model that you're only going to move up with winnings that you make. I think it's, even if you weren't being staked, like, you know, I'm talking about this from my perspective as a, as a backer who runs a company, but like if I was a player even, and I had $1,500 to make this work, I would probably start at 25 cent games. You know, what is that like going to give me something like 70 buy-ins or so? If I'm doing the math right, I would want to be like overrolled and it wouldn't feel fun to be playing, you know, really small stakes. I would want to be playing higher, but my perspective around the investment, my perspective around the reality of the investment model is balanced enough at this point to see that I would not be doing myself a favor to be playing under rolled. Too many bad things can happen. Too much stress can develop. And I love this, this idea. One of the biggest mindset shifts for me was working with Elliot Rowe when I was telling him, it was when we were on those games where we had big opportunities. You know what I'm talking about back in 2017. Uh, and I had the opportunity to play higher than I was technically bankrolled for, safely bankrolled for. And I really wanted to do it because those games were really soft. And I felt like I was missing opportunity by not doing it. But I was feeling really stressed when I was in those games. And I had a talk with Elliot about, it. I was like, all right, here's what's going on. What do you think? And he said, you know, sometimes there are healthy forms of stress. This is one of them. You are, your mind is telling you you're playing outside of your bankroll and it's causing you to be stressed out as a warning sign that you know that you shouldn't be risking this type of volatility with the bankroll that you have. And that was a shift for me because usually I would look at stress and I'd be like, oh, there must be a way I can fix this stress by just playing better. I could just like learn more about the game and the stress would go away. But like, there's another layer to this. The variance of being outside of your bankroll will naturally cause stress. And that is a healthy, it's almost like a healthy alert. So that was an important uh, realization for me that helped me to start to accept the reality of, of, of poker as an investment model where you've got to be very, very careful how much you bite off at one time because there's always the possibility that things could go wrong. And this is no different from sports betting or anything. The first thing they teach you is because the edge is not as much as you think, you need to be more conservative than you think. And they show models for this constantly about like it, uh, aggressive sports bettors versus conservative sports bettors over long periods of time. And the aggressive guy might get off to a good start and look like he's crushing it. But over a large sample, he's out of the game because he overextended his bankroll and couldn't recover a downswing. So it's probably the biggest, the biggest thing you can understand for bankroll management is how realistic and almost inevitable it is that you're going to endure a downswing mm -hmm. and you need to be, you need to have the bankroll to be able to deal with that. And you also need to be trying to develop the mindset to be able to be resilient to that so that you can actually still be a winning player when it happens. I'm, I'm not sure you're going to like what I'm going to say next, but I also have um, some um, opposing arguments against the very conservative bankroll management um, viewpoint. Sure. And the main reason I think this way is because I've been thinking a lot about starting up, um, like reading a, a lot about startups, reading all, all about scaling and the really successful companies, the super, super big companies, they've always taken a very like do or die kind of approach mm. where there's a, there's a decent chance that they fail and that the company doesn't work. But all of those that have done really well have had this approach. And the reason for this is because time is also a, a, a valuable resource. And if we think about purely managing our risk of ruin, then yes, going for a conservative bank management approach is good. But if we bring in time as a factor of like, you know, when we play poker, most people aren't that certain that they're going to play poker forever. And if you are a little bit more aggressive about it, you reach the point where you either do well or you, or you are ruined um, quicker and that saves you time. And, and that is actually a resource to consider as well. I mean, for a CFP program, maybe the, 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 the measurements are a bit different, but if somebody busts that 1500 bankroll, 
maybe that's not necessarily a bad thing because for, for the sake of that player, for the sake of the company, some players need to bust. <laughs> some players need to bust, and, and it's likely that if that guy busts a $1,500 bankroll, he probably was not a winning player the majority of the time. I think what it really comes down to, whether or not you should be more aggressive or more conservative, is like, I said this the other day too, like, what other options do you have? If you have other options, you can clearly be more aggressive in one area. So I started to think that maybe diversification is the most important thing to be able to reduce the stress around being more aggressive in one area. If poker is all you have, if you have only $1,500, no friends and no network connections, mm. and you have to make the poker thing work, you need to be using conservative bankroll management for sure. Yeah. But if you, have, if you have opportunities where you can fail at this thing and people have faith in you and they'll put you on over here, well, then by all means, I think, you should probably be much, much more aggressive. It's funny. I remember making a post. Oh, I forget exactly how it went, but I, okay, this is what it said. This was like two years ago and Elliot came into the thread and he actually like, he, he said something and then told me in private, he didn't agree with my, with my answer. But my post was basically, if you had a hundred thousand dollar bankroll and I offered you a hundred thousand dollar bet where you had a 60% chance of winning, would you take it? So you're either going to go completely broke or, you know, 40% of the time you're dead broke, 60% of the time you double up and then some, um, or you just double up more than half the time. So it's clearly an awesome bet. And a lot of people were like, yeah, like let it ride. And I came back and I said, the most important consideration before you take this bet is, is how rich your friends are <laughs> or something like that. Like what other network connections do you have? Because you know, if you have an opportunity to sack back up and get staked or something, then yeah, you know, this might be the better bet to take. And Elliot, he, he looked at it a different way and he was like, I don't know why you would want to make yourself dependent on someone else by losing that bet. Like he valued that part of it more. And I thought that was kind of interesting. There's, there's definitely tons of different angles and layers that you could peel that from depending on what your value system is and depending how you perceive the, the potential outcomes of like what happens after failure. That's, that's a question that I think most people don't investigate. Most people's mind goes black when they think about going broke, but realistically there's almost always options available past that point that we don't really consider. So uh, do you want to hear my opinion on the hundred thousand dollar question? I feel like you would take it. No, there's just no chance I would take it. Even if you, you give me take a the bet, I would not take the bet. Even, Even if, if you I was, give me eighty percent, I, mean, I might not take the bet. But what if I was your friend and I was and I had like a lot of money and I said, you know, Wayne, don't worry if you lose this bet, I'm gonna put you back on. Still no. I, I'm still not gonna take the bet. And I mean, I'm in a situation where I have a lot of friends that would, would definitely put me into games if I if I wanted that to happen. Um, so what's your reasoning behind that? I think the opportunity cost of money is very different. The first 100K is worth so much more than the next 100K. Oh, and okay. So like the, if 100K was all you had, you wouldn't take it, you're saying? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, I, get, I can get behind that, that dimension of it too. And maybe that's even more important than who your friends are. Because even if you had friends who are going to put you on, they're going to take a cut off your winnings now. So you're your profits are not going to be as good if you get staked by other people. Yeah. And I'm probably not going to play as well or lead as good a happy life that I'm leading like with hundred K, you know, I can, I feel like if I have hundred K, I can eat healthy. I can go to the gym and stuff. But if I'm dead broke, um, these things might not be a legitimate part of the option. And those are things to consider too. hundred K in the bank. You're sitting pretty, you're sitting really pretty. What is your number then? If it's not 80, when do you start taking the bet? Yeah, I can't I've imagine of, not taking it at 90. Okay, it depends on how much money I have. If it's 100K, no, it's, then, all, it's all your money. If, yeah, I know. Okay, really, really what is, do, do you even have a number that you take it at if it's all your money? It depends on how much money it is. That's what I'm saying. If I have a million, it's very different from when it's 100K. Because if but, it's a million um, or if it's 10 million, I'm, I'm it'll probably be 99% like, or like 95%. Yeah. 
because like I have all of my needs met right now. Having that extra money doesn't really change my life very much. Um, but losing all of that money changes my life a lot. And I'm yeah. not willing to think. But if it's a hundred K, like I don't think a hundred K is enough to live the life that I'm living right now. If that's that's what I had to my name, right? So I would be more willing to take a little bit more risk. So it would probably be in the 90% range. If I had like 5K in my bank account, then I'd probably be a, a lot more aggressive. Uh, um, I'll probably take the 60% in that spot because I can borrow money and that's okay. Yeah, I think that makes sense. I can't see 90 being not a good bet if you have less than 100K to your name. I hope it happens someday so we can <laughs> put, put, put that wisdom to good work. I hope it happens to you. <laughs> I hope <laughs> you get that brilliant opportunity. What else I'll you have say that, I'd say that if the skill is a little bit different and it's putting 25% or 50% of my bankroll on the line, it's a very, very different thing. And that's the reason I'm willing to take this 25%, put 25% on the table. It's because, you know, it's not that easy to stack off and lose the hand of poker to the, to the bad player. <laughs> like, you usually can put your money in, like, with the stone cold nuts. Uh, um. <laughs> I don't know about the nuts, but, yeah, you, you have a lot of edge for sure. Yeah, so um, maybe we can wrap up with, do you have any other topics that you want to cover regarding Anything about victim mentality or bankroll management, or maybe to tie these two points together? Yeah, there's this one thing I, that I want to circle back to, which is that you can play different styles. Uh, a, lot of way, a lot of times the best way to look at the style that you're playing is to look at the standard deviation of your style my style is very aggressive. There are versions of it that I offer to students. I, I basically give less aggressive versions of my system to the newer students. And the reason that I do that is because through experience, we've been made aware that players who are not as stable in terms of their long-term success already, their track record, have a harder time dealing with variance. So even though the most aggressive version of our system is the highest EV version, it is the winningest version that we've been able to basically support through the data. I don't necessarily think that is the best version for a new player to be playing because the volatility is so high that it risks potentially throwing him into a mindset downward spiral where he's not able to recover. So I think I kind of mentioned this a little bit before, but you've really got to pay attention to if the style is tame enough for your current mindset stability. And that's an honest discussion you have to have with yourself because you know, you're, you're watching your heroes on TV who are super aggressive players and you've got to understand those guys are introducing more variance by doing that. And if you're not comfortable with that, it's going to turn into a very dangerous career for you very quickly because you're going to be trying to play like people who you think are very good not able to deal with the natural variance that you incur by doing that and most of the time what happens is you end up 20 by and you on you end up on a 20 by and downswing completely deflated if you've never really learned how to deal with that yet and now you've sort of put yourself in a very deep hole that you have to crawl out of so i think this is like this is probably very similar to why we decided to give very tight preflop ranges in this introduction of this course is because not only is it easier for a beginning player to navigate tighter ranges, but it definitely is going to reduce the variance of the game, which will have a positive mindset effect on the player's longevity. And I think it's a dimension that gets overlooked and having seen how the alternative plays out, introducing highly volatile strategies to new players, I think it's a mistake. I think it's an oversight that, uh, that is easy to make if you're only focused on, on making people the winningest players possible as fast as possible. 
So it, it, to me, it's the thing that is one of the most interesting in terms of developing, uh, developing methodologies and developing systems to train players is like, you've got to be aware of the mindset dimension and the technical dimension at the same time. If you're going to find these balance points, otherwise you're going to overlook something where, you know, something that seemed good in theory on paper, like have them play the most aggressive strategy. All the data says they should be as aggressive as this. You're going to overlook the fact that that player is not capable of handling that level of variance introduced by that, by that style of aggression. And that's a, potentially bigger deal it's not just it's not just the variant the other big factor is that they're going to implement it usually the high, the more winning strategy and the more volatile strategy is also more complex and the more complex Definitely. the strategy the more you deviate from the strategy like it's hard to 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 follow that strategy as closely i mean if you just think about any spot like any game that you play even you can't just watch like the nba player play and then when he does a trick you try to implement that trick like a lot of times these tricks they work because he's an nba player like if you take that same strategy and implement it into your game you aren't going to implement that strategy as well and it's probably not going to work out as well for you for sure the more nuanced the strategy is the definitely the harder it is to implement it consistently especially when it's not working in the in the short term that's when you really see everything spin out of control People are getting negative confirmation bias. They're getting convinced that something's wrong. This doesn't work. So they stop implementing it and they start deviating. Then you can't even track their progress anymore because they're not even doing the thing that they should be doing anymore. Yeah, it almost makes me feel like sometimes it's a lot better or, or, or like our responsibility as coaches and as um, teachers or whatever you want to call it. It's like just an not let the beginner student be exposed to very complex ideas because once they they know about the complex ideas they want them oh it's almost impossible to like i'm trying to find a solution to this because i'm totally on board with everything you just said unless you're going to completely isolate the bottom portion of your team from the top portion of your team they're going to end up talking to each other in some way shape or form and ideas are going to get passed back and forth and I think that's, that's really the thing I'm trying to solve. And, and maybe there's no way to solve it because as soon as a early division player realizes that the higher division player has technical resources that he doesn't have, well, now there's an asymmetry that develops and he's going to want that. He's going to maybe even feel like he should be able to have that now. And that creates performance issues for sure. So I agree. I think the most important thing is guarding them from over complex content and protecting them from a downswing and the second one is a really hard thing because sometimes it requires that you have to like we've paused players contracts this happened in january we did a, a team-wide review of our early division players and we made a decision to pause half of the contracts or more at the early divisions because i went in and i did a hand history review of every player and i was like i don't like what i see and i feel like you know, I could let you guys keep playing and maybe some of you are even marginal winners, but I care about the longevity of your contract. And if you guys go on a 20 buy and downswing, it makes it way less likely that you're going to recover. And that's something that a, a new player won't really see. He doesn't have the perspective that the coach does to see how unlikely it is that he's going to actually recover and be a winning player long-term if he goes on an initial downswing when on contract. Um, so those conversations are hard to have, but I actually think they really build the connection and the trust between student and backer because the guys that did come back from that, that process and, and get back on contract after improving, I think that the, not only do they appreciate that we protected their contract, but they appreciated the honesty that like they weren't playing well and we wanted to make sure they were playing better before we moved them up the ladder to higher stakes. So this, I think this is like, it's probably my biggest uh, passion in terms of ways to look for problem solving. I still play poker, but my favorite way to problem solve is to look from the bird's eye view of how a community of players is operating and then really try to move the pieces around in a way that creates some sort of synergetic balance almost for how everything works. All the working systems are cohesive and 
everything is in some sort of supportive yet dynamic flux. That's what really like, and I think we're almost there. And, and that's, what's exciting to me is when you get a, when you get a project to the point where the systems work and the players are happy and, and, and feel supported, I think that's like a, a very uh, fulfilling thing. Like that's to me, when I get that right, I've told you this, but like I'm, when I get that right, I feel like I'm going to be able to walk away from that and, or hand it over to Gabe or, you know, hand it down to someone who has control over it and feel like I've done my, I've done my job. I feel like I've put something in place that works that will provide a avenue for players in the years to come to, to do their thing and move up in stakes. Yeah. Since, since you talked a lot about the CFP and how the whole program is run, right? Why don't you give a little bit of a, or like, I'm curious about it and maybe other listeners or, or readers might be interested about it as well. Like how can somebody apply? Are you always open sure. to new students or how does it work? Yeah, thanks for the entry point, Wayne. I, it's funny, we're actually just reopening contracts uh, at the beginning of next month. So beginning of May 2019, we'll be reopening. Uh, we haven't taken new students in three months because we just made some huge technical upgrades and um, we've been working really closely with the current guys. But we're at a place now where we feel really, really good about the program and opening it up to basically wider avenues. So if you do want to apply... Go to pokerdetox.com. There's a CFP tab. You'll fill out an application. Uh, we've actually upped our requirements basically because we really want to contract players who are capable of playing a lot of hands. You don't have to play a ton, but we want to see that you have a track record of having played at least 100,000 hands. So you'll fill out a short survey of, of just about who you are and what your goals are as a player, and then we'll ask you to attach a graph of uh, a proof that you've played a hundred thousand hands at some point in the last year or something. Um, and that's it. You do a short video, freestyle video, whatever you want, just sort of showing us kind of who you are. And if you get accepted, you go into a training flight and then uh, assuming that your results are good in that training period, you go straight into contract. That's how it works. All right. Perfect. I, I guess this is a good place to wrap up. So look, yeah, we're going to cover more mindset stuff. And yeah, let's discuss on WhatsApp what topics we'll cover next. For sure. Bye, guys.